All right. There's no turning back now. Um, <laughs> welcome to uh, my first ever solo live stream. Um, my name is Eric Manning. Of course, you're watching Testify. Really appreciate you guys hanging out with me uh, on this morning or maybe it's afternoon where you're at. Um, and today I wanted to talk to you guys uh, about modern miracles in Christianity. This is actually based on a talk that I recently gave. I was invited to speak uh, to a group, uh, the Talk About Doubts group, um, with Dr. Jonathan McClatchy. Um, some of you might have even seen it if you if you follow the Talk About Doubts channel. Uh, this is an expanded version of this particular talk, but I wanted to talk to you guys today about modern miracles in Christianity. And if this goes well, if this stream goes well, it, maybe I'll do more of these kind of long form, you know, kind of discussions and just have some fun with it. Uh, I'm not trying to be the next, you know, Mike Winger or something with the two hour streams or anything else like that. Um, but yeah, we'll just see how it goes. Um, but as a text, I picked uh, 1 Corinthians 2 5, and it says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. And I think it'll be pretty obvious as we go along why I picked this particular text. And so why do we want to talk about modern miracles in Christianity? Like, why is this important? Why even bring it up? Well, I think it's pretty obvious that critics frequently allege or question, I should say, the historical reliability of the Gospels in the book of Acts, primarily due to philosophical reasons centered around the presence of miracles within them. And so if you guys remember my conversation with uh, Derek Lambert, when he and Inspiring Philosophy and Than from Exploring Reality joined me and we had a, a lively debate discussion, one of the things that Derek constantly kept saying, uh, which I love the guy, uh, but he kept saying, you know, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. And what is the, the quacking sound uh, that Derek is hearing when he's reading the Gospels? Well, I think primarily it's the extraordinary. It's the miracle accounts that are in them. And so um, critics, you know, I'm not just making this up. We know that critics have said this kind of thing. Uh, here's D.F. Strauss. He is uh, basically the father of New Testament criticism, um, modern biblical criticism. And he says that the contradiction between the supernatural accounts and the natural element, which alone is historically available, cannot be reconciled so long as the Gospels or even a single one of them was taken as truly and fully historical. This indeed they could not be for the simple reason that they contain supernaturalism. And so here's Strauss laying all of his cards on the table. And he's just basically saying, because of a philosophical presupposition, I don't think that the gospels could possibly be historical, even if they are the mundane events that they record are historical because there's miracles in the text. Now, he's not the only one. This is New Testament scholar Gerd Ludemann. Uh, some of you may uh, have seen his debate with William Lane Craig. This is actually something that uh, Gerd said in his debate. He said, anybody who says that Jesus rose from the dead is faced with another problem that I shall address later. Namely, if you say that Jesus rose from the dead biologically, you have to presuppose that a decaying corpse, which is already cold and without blood in its brain, could be made alive again. I think that is nonsense. And so it's almost as if Gerd is saying, like, why are we even having this discussion? It's, uh, you know, 20 whatever. I don't remember when the debate was. I guess it was around 2000, maybe late 90s. Uh, why are we having this? We know better. Science has taught us that this stuff doesn't happen. And so therefore, why are we even having this discussion? And some of you probably more recently have seen the Bart Ehrman, Justin Bass debate. Um, that was... Uh, Probably not the, the the tack that Bass, if anybody's watched his channel for a while, uh, took to debate Ehrman would not be the path that I took. Um, but regardless, Ehrman laid all of his cards out on the table when he said that I don't think anybody got raised from the dead because it violates the laws of nature. I don't think God, if he exists, I'm assuming on Ehrman's view, can break the laws of physics any more than he can break the laws of mathematics. Now, I think there are some philosophically informed atheists out there who would say, whoa, Bart, that's going too far. But the point remains, here is a very noted um, biblical scholar. Uh, you can't get more influential than Bart Ehrman, right? Uh, saying that he doesn't think that these things happen because uh, these things that are reported in the New Testament and the Gospels or 1 Corinthians or whatever, um, because of the presence of miracles, this just can't be historical. So um, this is a major, major hangup. 
So what we want to do uh, in rebutting the miracle skeptic is we want to take a two-step approach. Now, I'm indebted to Caleb Jackson, a uh, acquaintance of mine, super good guy, uh, really smart, has done a lot of research on the study of modern day miracles. Uh, he'll be coming out with a book, uh, hopefully soon here, uh, which I'll be mentioning at the end of the stream. Um, he's been on Trinity Radio. He's been on C Capturing Christianity, discussing some of these. Uh, so some of the material I'm going to be using is borrowed from Caleb, uh, which he's totally fine with. Um, we, we get along. Um, it's the case, case studies are going to be different, most of them. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to make sure that I give him a shout out. Uh, in rebutting the miracle skeptic, we want to take a two-step approach. Number one, we want to demonstrate the existence of numeral, numeral, <laughs> numerous, see, live is a little bit different, numerous religiously contextualized events that are well-documented but lack an adequate uh, natural explanation. And then step two, we want to reasonably deduce that Christianity provides the most plausible explanation for these occurrences, prompting critics to reconsider their philosophical biases against the text. And so, as you guys know, I am uh, one of those maximalists. I say, hey, let's argue for the historical reliability of the Gospels. And then from there, let's take an approach that what the, um, the Gospels go back to is what the original eyewitnesses claimed, and why would they make such claims in the presence of a hostile audience and if what we have in the Gospels is reliable, then it would be very difficult for them to be mistaken. But if you have seen, it is sometimes difficult to have that conversation with somebody who just already assigns such a really low prior probability uh, to that even being, th that whole case getting off the ground because of their prejudice against miracles. And so we want to show that these events are, are something that are happening today and put that in our background knowledge to raise the prior probability. So, oh, all right. So how do we establish a miraculous healing? Well, here is Cardinal Lambertini. Uh, he later became Pope Benedict the 14th, I believe. Uh, and this was around the time of the Deus controversy, which is pretty interesting. For those of you who don't know, the Deus controversy uh, happened in like the late 1600s, 1700s, and, and part of the 1800s. And this is where David Hume uh, wrote his famous essay of miracles, wanting to cast uh, doubt on that, you know, that we could ever trust the testimony of a miraculous report. And of course, Hume is writing in England and uh, or Great Britain, whatever. I, I know Hume is Scottish, uh, but he's writing around that time. And, you know, you have the Anglican Church there uh, and a lot of Protestants in his neck of the woods. And of course, Catholics, they're saying, hey, we are the one true church. We got the miracles. Well, as a knee jerk kind of reaction, in my opinion, the Protestant reformers uh, went pretty heavy cessationist, uh, starting with John Calvin and saying, no, we have the full canon of scripture. We don't need miraculous claims. Miracles, if they do continue to happen, um, a rare event of, of miracles and healings and different things like that, those basically kind of went out with the early church. Uh, we don't really need that anymore. Um, and so it's in this atmosphere where Hume is trying to pit the Protestants in his area against the Catholics. And he's bringing up some Catholic miracle claims and saying, listen, you guys don't believe these. And, you know, these are modern reports. Why are you going to try and tell me that, you know, somebody rose from the dead 2000 years ago? And so pretty crafty of Hume. But anyways, it's in this atmosphere that Cardinal Lambertini uh, came up with this criteria because the Protestants were saying, yeah, you guys have miracle claims but your miracle claims are bogus. <laughs> they're, they're poorly evidenced. And so what did he come up with? Some criteria that reasonable people could look at and go, okay, if a, a claim passes these marks, then there's good reason to think that it's true. So number one, uh, we want to know that the uh, diagnosis and the healing were both medically documented, all right? The more medical documentation, the better. We want to know the befores. We want to know the afters um, from the the doctors. Number two, we want to know that the illness was organic and not psychosomatic. And so we don't want an illness to just be living in somebody's head. Uh, we want it to be something that's organic, that it's actually something that is living in their body or there's real loss of function in their body, not because of a mental issue, but because of something organic physically going on. Number three, the illness was progressive and showed no improvement prior to the healing. And so 
we don't want a situation where the person was already kind of getting better and then they were prayed for and then they, you know, improved even more. Uh, no, we want the uh, case to be where the person is progressively going down in terms of their health. Uh, number four, the healing is permanent and not temporary. And so generally they will wait the Catholic church when they are evaluating miracle claims. Now, of course, I'm not Catholic, but I think this criteria is very good. Um, we, they will wait, make sure that it's something permanent. It's not something that, you know, comes back within a year or two. Sadly, I know of a case of a, a little girl in Texas that was even reported in the news that she was, uh, some sort of, a experienced a miracle because she had some very serious, I, I think the cancer was pretty far down the line. I don't know if it got all the way to stage four, uh, but she was apparently miraculously healed. But two years later, the cancer resurfaced with a vengeance and she died. And that's not really a, a good testimony. We kind of want to wait these things out when we are talking about these things with skeptics and people who you know, might be kind of slow to believe miracle claims. Uh, number five, the healing was instantaneous and not gradual. Uh, we don't want to hear about, you know, it took six months, nine months. Hey, if, if God worked and it took a period of time and you're one of those people who thinks that God did it, even though it took like maybe three months and it should have taken a year and that's, that's better than nothing, that's great. But again, we want to have some high standards here. Uh, instantaneous is basically kind of the pattern that we see in the Bible. And so that's what we want to see. That's going to be a, a far more impressive, right? Um, now, another thing that I want to add, just because you don't have all seven of these things doesn't mean that like a miracle didn't happen. Um, it's just, this is the criteria that we want to use to have, a, again, a high standard of evidence um, that is like more difficult to refute. Number six, that the healing was complete and not merely partial. And so we want full function, full function of what was lost, what was not working to return. And finally, number seven, that the healing was spontaneous and not attributable to treatment. And so it want, we want it to be something that uh, we can't just say, well, they were also taking this particular medicine at the same time that would have had probably the same effect. Um, you know, we, we this is, needs to be something that was spontaneous and, and couldn't have been medicine. We want to be able to rule that out. And so um, we're going to look at some case studies. Now, some of you hopefully have seen my video uh, with Bruce Van Nata. We talked for about an hour and a half. Um, very, very interesting miracle case. Also, very interesting case of a near-death experience. Um, so if you want to, you can go back and check that out. Um, I really love talking to the guy. It was a fascinating, fascinating story. Definitely worth your time. But for those of you who don't know, uh, Bruce was working late one night and a jack gave way. He was a truck mechanic working with semi-trucks, big trucks, logging trucks. Um, and he had his lower abdomen crushed underneath the semi-truck. The jack gave way. It fell on his lower abdomen. And he basically said that he was pretty much pancaked down to the floor. He said there was, he was like, uh, it was like a Wile E. Coyote cartoon almost. I mean, he was like crushed uh, down to his spine. Um, very scary situation. Uh, despite having, he also had several of his arteries were, were severed. Um, survival was medically unexpected. Um, he's actually the only person to survive such injuries. He should have bled to death in 10 minutes, um, but he survived. That's not the miracle though. His small intestine was severely damaged. Most of it had to be removed, leaving 121 centimeters. The average human intestine length is 600 centimeters. His ileum was reduced from 350 centimeters to 25. Uh, he was unable to digest food properly. In fact, he couldn't even eat. He was on drip feeding basically through an IV. Uh, his doctors wouldn't even really, they argued with him about eating ice chips. He had to um, basically yell at the doctors and the nurses uh, and convince them to even be able to eat ice. Uh, he dropped weight uh, like crazy. He said that when um, he was in the hospital, he basically felt like he looked like a Holocaust victim. Uh, he went down from a healthy weight of 180 to about 125. Um, these are some of some of you have asked in the comments for that particular video uh, about some of his medical records. Um, I guess if you're going back uh, watching this or if you want to pause it right now and just catch up later, that's fine. Um, you can see uh, some of the uh, records from the doctors of what went what went on there. Um, most importantly, it talks about uh, the ileum there. Um, this is one of your most crucial parts of your small intestines for nutrient absorption. 
Bruce only had 7% of what is normal. Um, and so that is the report of the before. Um, so what happened with Bruce is he had, um, his wife was asking for people to pray for him and that he would be healed. And a friend, kind of more of an acquaintance of his, uh, living in New York City, a pastor, uh, got wind of Bruce's situation. And he woke up one morning and he was praying for Bruce and he felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, I want you to buy a plane ticket, fly to Wisconsin. This man, again, was living in New York. And I want you to pray for Bruce. Well, the man argued with uh, the Lord a little bit and didn't really want to go through all of that trouble. Um, the very next day, he was praying again. He heard the same voice telling him to do the exact same thing. So he decided to obey. Uh, he traveled to Wisconsin. He visited Bruce in the hospital. He prayed for his healing. He commanded his small intestine to grow in the name of Jesus. Van Atta said that he felt like an electric jolt uh, and that he was healed. His small intestine actually doubled in length and became fully functional. This was confirmed by multiple radiologists. Um, he said that he had an atheist doctor look at the situation. There was a Christian doctor who looked at the situation. Um, this is something that was like well documented, well looked at, and it appears now, of course, you can't just rip the guy open and measure out his intestines. So these are best estimates that he at least regained 50% uh, where he was way lower and 50%, you can absolutely survive on just fine. And that's a minimum of 50%. Uh, Van Atta remains healthy uh, uh, years later. This happened in 2006. Well, I just talked to him in 2023. And yeah, he's defying all medical odds, still healthy, and all of that good stuff. And so skeptics are always saying, hey, you know, why doesn't God heal amputees? Well, the regrowth of intestines, I would say that's pretty impressive. No, it's not an appendage that you can just visibly see. But again, we have the radiologists who have looked at it. And by all accounts, it's at least 50% back, if not 70. Now, interestingly enough, um, and the reason why I'm talking about these first two cases is one, I've talked personally to Bruce Van Atta. Uh, with the case of Chris Gunderson here, uh, this is actually a picture of him talking to my friend uh, Caleb Jackson and Than. Um, on exploring reality. And they actually interviewed Chris just as I interviewed Bruce. And also uh, Bruce knows Chris because um, Bruce ended up sharing his testimony in a lot of different churches, ended up actually going in full-time ministry, uh, praying for the sick. And he actually prayed for Chris Gunderson when he was a teenager. Uh, at two weeks old, Chris Gunderson experienced severe vomiting. He was just projectile vomiting, couldn't hold anything down. Uh, he was diagnosed with gastroparesis and needed feeding tubes. Now, for those of you who don't know, gastroparesis is basically like his stomach just does not work. It's paralyzed. It's not functional. Okay. Um, gastroparesis. Well, <laughs> I guess that's on my next bullet point there, but we'll go ahead and read it. Impedes stomach emptying. Medical technology manages symptoms, but it offers no cure. And I'm told um, that most people with gastroparesis uh, don't survive beyond the age of 18. Surgeons added a, I'm not even going to begin to try and pronounce that, some sort of a, a medical limb at 11 months old to reroute stomach emptying. And Chris relied on a J-tube feeding for 16 years. He struggled with inadequate nutrition. And so his parents were nice enough to let him do normal things, run around, play. Uh, he was even on the high school basketball team. But Chris reports in the interview on Exploring Reality that sometimes he would just pass out and just collapse in the middle of the basketball game. And I'm sure this would be kind of jarring and alarming, but to his teammates, it just became kind of like a normal thing. Um, but they were trying to let him live as much of a normal childhood as he could, which, I mean, if you're a parent, that obviously makes a whole lot of sense. Now, as I said, um, Van Atta was in the area and his parents basically dragged Chris to church and to hear Van Atta's miraculous healing, healing story. Um, they asked Van Atta to pray for him at the end of the service. And while Van Atta prayed, Chris experienced pulsing and contraction sensations in his abdomen. Interestingly enough, Van Atta, when I was talking to him about Chris and the video, um, he said that Chris was complaining like, wow, this is actually kind of painful. Can you guys stop? And Van Otto was like, no, we're, we're going to keep going until we're satisfied. And so for some of you, that might sound strange. Um, I don't necessarily have a, a super deep biblical explanation of that. Uh, we do see like the woman with the issue of, the, of blood. Jesus felt power coming out of him. 
and that she felt that she was whole of that plague, the Bible says. But it, it's strange. I don't know how all that works, but this is what they reported. Uh, that night, Chris was able to eat his first oral meal without complications. And his primary care physician and gastroenterologist couldn't explain the resolution. Now, if you watch the end stream, there's actually um, uh, two quotes from the doctors uh, that Caleb has. And so I encourage you to watch that if you want some of the doctor quotes. I thought about putting them on the slides here, um, but just for the sake of time, and we have several cases to go through, I didn't include it. I'm just going to refer you to Than's stream, but definitely very, very impressive healing. And this was a healing that was also discussed on the Unbelievable podcast uh, with Justin Brierley. And uh, it was between Craig Keener and Joshua Brown, who were arguing that miracles still continue today. And we have good evidence for miracles. And I forget the name of the person who was a skeptic. He was actually a Christian, uh, Peter May. Um, he He's a Christian, but he's like kind of like a hardcore cessationist or something. Um, it was a very interesting and lively debate. I've never seen Dr. Keener yell before or get angry before. If you've ever, if you know Craig Keener at all, he's like the most mild mannered man in the world. Um, but uh, yeah, he, after May was just completely belligerent and really unprofessional, to be honest. Um, it was interesting to see Keener let him have it. So if you really, if you, if you like spice, uh, go check that out. Um, and so uh, very interesting discussion. Gunderson's case was one of the ones that discussed was discussed. Oh, and finally, the tubes, four months later, the doctors were cautious. Uh, they did want to wait a full four months, but Chris was eating food normally. Um, and then four months later, they did uh, remove them. And this was documented as a medical case study. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about Sister Bernadette Moreau. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, Matthew, if you're out there, uh, let me know how bad my French is. Um, but this is a uh, Catholic nun who spent half of her life, I believe this didn't, healing didn't happen until she was in her 70s or 80s. She suffered from cauda equina, which is a disorder of the nerves and lower spine. Um, and so this was like decades that she had this particular condition. Now to walk at all, she needed a back and a leg brace and she had like an implant to dull the nerve pain and she required massive doses of morphine. Uh, she also had a dropped foot, uh, a left foot that was twisted and limp. Um, I will actually include later on in the description, uh, a doctor giving kind of a full rundown of how bad her condition was, um, if you're interested in that. Uh, she traveled to Lourdes, France 15 years ago. Now, for those of you who don't know, I believe it was in the late 19th century that it was believed that the uh, Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to a group of French people and there was these main apparitions and people have come to Lourdes, France. Um, there was, is there, I believe it was in like a grotto or something. I'm probably getting some of my facts incorrect. Some of you uh, uh, devout Catholics, please let me know where I'm getting something incorrect. But basically after this event, several healings took place. Now you might be wondering, Eric, why are you talking about this? You already mentioned earlier that you're not Catholic, you're a Protestant. Well, let's just address that elephant in the room real quick. Uh, Catholics, you don't think that somebody has to have perfect theology in order for them to be healed, because obviously I've seen many Catholics talk about Protestants who were healed. Um, and you do regard uh, us Protestants, usually generally is the case, uh, most Catholics and uh, according to Vatican II and all that is just kind of separated brethren. And, um, you know, we won't get into all of that. This channel is not really about that. Okay. Go to Gavin Ortland's channel, go to Trent Horn's channel. If you want to talk about those kind of things. And I don't want this, the comments to turn into some sort of Catholic versus Protestant debate. But what I'm trying to say is I don't think anybody thinks that you have to have perfect theology in order to receive healing from Jesus. I think God is looking for any open doors that he possibly can find. And as a Protestant, I would just say that like, you don't have to have perfect theology, just like Catholics don't think you have to have perfect theology in order to be healed. So um, I probably said that in more of a long-winded way than necessary, but you guys get the idea. So she joined a uh, Lord Eucharistic procession. She experienced what she believed was God's presence. Uh, she returned home spiritually rejuvenated, but physically she actually reported to uh, have felt worse. And she endured three days of severe pain from all of the travel and everything else. Uh, one day though, she did feel a sudden strength to walk to the chapel and pray. Uh, she experienced a heat sensation. 
Uh, she felt very relaxed. So it's interesting that all of these have some sort of like a physical sensation that these people felt so far. But she felt very relaxed and she actually heard an inner voice uh, tell her to remove her braces. Uh, her, she obeyed that voice, obviously. Her crooked foot straightened and she could walk with no pain. Now, very interestingly enough, she also experienced no withdrawals from morphine. And if you guys know anything about morphine, it's highly, highly addictive. She experienced no withdrawals uh, in the coming weeks or months. Uh, multiple specialists examined her. Extensive medical tests were conducted. Investigation included neurologists, rheumatologists, imagery, and electrophysiology tests. So she was tested a lot, okay? Like when the Catholic Church is going out to say this is a confirmable miracle, um, they do do their due diligence. That is one thing that I definitely respect about um, how they investigate these particular things. After eight years of investigation, her cure was deemed medically explained. Uh, she, her case was actually featured on 60 Minutes. This is Dr. Alessandro de Francisi. Uh, again, sorry, my French is terrible. Um, let me know how I'm mispronouncing that. But he says that Sister Bernadette, this was on the show, has been reviewed and evaluated by over 300 physicians. If any of our viewers who are doctors happen to visit Southern France and want to examine Sister Bernadette's case file, I'll be more than happy to show them. Our approach is open, collaborative, and transparent, and there are no secrets. Uh, and so her case was very, very much highly investigated. Okay, this is Greg Spencer, um, and I'm going to show you a video in a moment of letting Greg speak in his own words. So I'll kind of breeze through a little bit here um, what went on with Greg. Um, he began to suffer vision problems in his late 30s in August of 1998. He was diagnosed with juvenile macular degeneration. His eyesight worsened over a few months, and Greg became legally blind. Um, he had basically 2,400 in his right eye and 2,200 in his left eye, uh, by May of 1999. So he was going through, you know, learning to live his life as a blind man. He was being trained to do that. Uh, he registered with the Oregon Commission to the Blind in 99. He also began to receive disability payments. Greg was a semi-truck driver. Um, he was also a former police officer. Uh, the reason why he went into truck driving after being in police work uh, it was, he was, experienced a whole lot of trauma, um, seeing some pretty bad uh, situations with crime scenes and different things like that. And it just was too difficult on his mind. Uh, and so um, here is a letter from his doctor diagnosing Greg with uh, JMD. So again, if you want to pause the video, look closely at this. This is fine. This is all medically documented. Um, and here's a letter from the Oregon Commission of the Blind on June 23rd in 1999. So again, you're welcome to take a look at that. Um, basically, this kind of gives you an idea of what his vision was like. I'm sure you guys have all seen these eye tests, probably done them. And so this is what uh, 2200 and 2400 looks like. I know having my face here and, you know, if you're watching this on the phone, it might be difficult for you to see, but feel free to watch this on a computer or whatever later. Um, and so what happened with Greg is that in 2002, he attended a men's retreat where he had to wear thick glasses. He could still couldn't even read the print of his Bible. Um, he was praying for the healing of his mind because of the past trauma he experienced as a former police officer. And again, Greg is going to detail this a little bit more in a moment. And ophthalmology records two weeks later uh, in early May noted near perfect or instantaneous improvement, uncorrected acuity of now 2030. So good enough. Um, I don't think I even have 2030. And, um, you know, clearly I'm not wearing glasses. You, you guys probably know how all that works. So I don't have to explain that. Um, the Social Security Administration investigated Greg for fraud, concluded with all of his doctor notes that he really was blind and now could see, uh, to quote the, the famous hymn there. And so here is a doctor letter from his doctor, Dr. John Burpee, uh, as opposed to uh, Dr. John Jumping Jack, I guess. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know. That's terrible. Anyways, I'm a dad. I make the dad jokes. Um, but this basically says that he has all of his vision and this is the social security administration, uh, concluding their investigation. Uh, when you recover your sight after being blind, the, I guess the downside is you have to go back to work. Uh, definitely. I think most people would choose work over blindness any day. Uh, so yeah, all medically documented. Here is Greg in his own words here. I hope you guys can hear this well. 
I was a police officer for 15 years, majoring in narcotics enforcement. And during that nar narcotics enforcement, exposed myself to tremendous amounts of violence, hardcore pornography. I was just a very hard, callous man. It cost me my first marriage, as I put in my entire life into that career. I was also a deputy medical examiner, frequently seeing, having to, to view autopsies, unattended deaths, violent deaths, through motor vehicle accidents or whatever violence may be that man does to man. My brain was filled with all of that stuff. I gave up that career after that 15 years and went on to driving truck, which lasted about six months driving cross country. I began noticing a loss of vision. I went to an eye doctor and was examined and diagnosed with macular degeneration my vision went from 2020 down to about 2400 in a very short time and was deemed legally blind not only legally but literally blind I couldn't see I was on disability was looking at disability for the rest of my life was sent to the Oregon Commission for the Blind and went through the full training to be a functional blind man the white canyon training and the guide dog and everything there was to that at that same time in that area, er, that area of time, I met my current wife, Wendy, who was a born again on fire believer in Jesus Christ, who recognized what I was going through and drug me with her to church, where I was introduced to Jesus Christ and had an opportunity in 2001 to, to attend a men's retreat, which was, the topic was cleansing of the mind. I recognized I needed that. I couldn't sleep nights with the horrid graphic nightmares that I would constantly had. Closing my eyes with these visions of the violence, the pornography, the bodies was just overwhelming. I'd wake up screaming at night with these nightmares. I needed that. My prayer in that men's retreat was, Lord, cleanse my mind. Take this junk away. Set me free. I shortly after praying that felt the Lord telling me, You're clean. I opened my eyes and lo and behold, at the back of the stage where I sat in this chapel, I could see a tiny sign that said, Red Exit. And at that point, realized I had been cleansed of my sin, but I also been healed and my vision had been totally restored. Uh, being on disability, I now had to get off of disability. Going to the state to tell them I'm no longer disabled, I can see. Opened a one year long investigation, which the state concluded after numerous medical exams with a letter that was given to them by the professional eye doctor was that there had been a remarkable healing, a miraculous healing. This is some of the medical records that we received from Oregon Health Sciences University, Dr. Brad Seeley, dated uh, May 21st of 1999, when we first began my case, documenting the loss of visual acuity. There's even the graph of both eyes, as he did, showing where the vision loss was in both left and the right eye, with all his notations on it, uh, all the documentation of loss of vision, uh, going up and up and up, all of the documentation from him. Um, I don't have it out, but I do have documentation from the local doctor, as well as the letter from Dr. Burpee, clearing me of the investigation with the state of fraud. There was evidence of macular degeneration, but that it was healed and the scar tissue had been restored no explanation of how that could be other than it was remarkable. It seems to me that you get to a point where it strains credibility, where a person is willing to call everybody liars or willing to attribute to coincidence something that is so statistically improbable, cumulatively speaking, that it makes you wonder why they hold so tenaciously 
to a philosophical premise inherited from a, a philosopher a few centuries ago, David Hume, that they're not willing to be open to this kind of evidence. All right. And so I thought I'd leave that little bit by Dr. Keener there, because um, I think he makes a good point. And so that's Greg Spencer. Um, this is the fifth and final uh, case study that we're going to look at today. Uh, this is Barbara Kramisky Snyder. Um, some of you may have heard about this case. It's uh, probably the most impressive one to me uh, and definitely one of the most uh, talked about, one of the most popular. She was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis as a teenager. I'm not even going to get into all the details because I'm going to, again, play a uh, short video for you guys um, where Lee Strobel details some of the sufferings that she was going through, uh, and as well as hear from Barbara herself. Um, her MS progressed rapidly, leading her to severe physical deterioration and confinement to hospitals and home care. She basically only had like half a lung working. She went blind. She couldn't walk. Uh, she was basically just crippled up in a bed. It, she couldn't talk. She had like a tube in her mouth. It, it was a bad situation. After years of suffering, including being in a permanent fetal position, Barbara heard a divine voice telling her to get up and walk on Pentecost Sunday in 1981. So I was only like two years old at that particular time. Uh, so this was, you know, over 40 years ago. Um, despite having not walked for years, she miraculously stood up, her feet flat on the ground, and her blindness was cured. Her physical condition dramatically improved. Even her atrophied muscles were restored, and her collapsed lung was healed. So, I mean, that's pretty impressive. She got a, a full... Uh, uh, a full um, makeover, you know, like <laughs> completely done over there. Uh, medical professions, uh, professionals, excuse me, were astonished and deemed her healing to be medically impossible. And she went on to lead a normal life uh, for decades. Um, she passed away just a couple years ago uh, with no reoccurrence of MS. And so here is her talking to Lee Strobel. Um, and uh, well, Lee is going to kind of introduce a little bit more about our circumstances. Now, my book talks about lots of, of, of the documented miracles that have taken place, but the one that Oops. absolutely blew me away Sorry. the most was a woman by the name of Barbara Snyder. I interviewed Barbara at length. We have extensive medical records from her uh, dating back many years from the Mayo Clinic and, and her other physicians. We have multiple credible eyewitnesses with no motive to deceive. We have two of her doctors who were so blown away by what happened to her, they wrote about it in books. Because they said, I've got to write about this. It's unbelievable. So let me tell you what happened to Barbara. Barbara was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis at the Mayo Clinic. For the next several years, she just deteriorated, got worse and worse. She had repeated hospitalizations, repeated surgeries, until ultimately she was dying. And they put her in hospice at her home. So she's confined to bed at her home. One of her physicians, Dr. Harold P. Adolph, a board-certified surgeon who had performed 25,000 operations in his career, he called Barbara, quote, one of the most hopelessly ill patients I ever saw. Hopelessly ill. One of her lungs was non-functional. The other was just inflated at 50%. A tube was inserted into her neck and oxygen was pumped from canisters in her garage so she could breathe. She'd lost control of her urination and her bowels. She was legally blind. All she could see were, were sh gray shadows. Uh, a feeding tube was inserted into her stomach. She hadn't walked in like seven years, and so her legs had atrophied. Her muscles had, 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 had shrunken, and, and her legs atrophied. And, and she was curled up like a pretzel in her bed from her illness. Her hands were flexed so that her fingers were touching her wrists, and her feet were permanently flexed and extended. Her parents met with doctors, and they agreed there's nothing more medically that could be done. And they said the next time she contracts pneumonia, which because of her lung situation, she would contract it on a regular basis, they would not try to revive her because it would just prolong her inevitable death. Well, then one day, someone, a friend, called WMBI, which is the radio station in Chicago that's run by the Moody Bible Institute, a Christian radio station. And they said, would you announce and, and just ask people to pray for Barbara? Barbara's on her deathbed. Um, she's really suffering, um, would you please have people pray? And we know that a minimum of 450 Christians began to pray for Barbara. How do we know? Because they sent letters telling Barbara, we're praying for you. So what happened? 
I'm going to let Barbara uh, describe to you what happened next, to tell you herself what happened on Pentecost Sunday with her friends who came to her to read her some of these encouraging letters that the people who were praying for her had written to her. So let's watch, Barbara. June 7th, 1981. I'll never forget it. It was a day like any other day for me. That was one spent confined to bed, unable to breathe on my own, hooked up to machines, a tracheostomy tube in my neck, my arms curled up, my legs curled up. I lay there trapped inside my own body is really how it felt. I had two friends over. They came over all the time. They were from my church. My church family never forgot me. So while they were there, I still remember exactly what they were reading when all of a sudden um, I heard a booming authoritative loud voice over my shoulder over here say, my child, get up and walk. And there was nobody else in the room. And there was no one else in the room, and the door was over here. There were windows over this way. And instantly, I knew it was God. But instantly, I also knew that my friends didn't hear that, hmm. which is kind of interesting, too. Yeah. Um, and I needed to share with them what I heard. Well, I had this tracheostomy tube in my neck. That's how I breathed. And I had hands that did not work. So my friends said, whenever I looked agitated, they knew I wanted to talk. So they'd come and plug the hole in my neck. And I said, I don't know what you're going to think about this, but God just told me to get up and walk. And my friends got really quiet. <laughs> I know, but he really did tell me to get up and walk. Run, get my family. I want them to be here. And um, my friends all of a sudden jumped up. And while they jumped, so did I. I was so excited, I couldn't wait for anyone. <laughs> and I literally jumped out of the bed. This, this is where you'd almost have to have known me to see how totally impossible that was. So this time, I remember reaching up and pulling my oxygen off my neck. I remember that. And then I jumped toward the voice. My friends are over here, but I jumped towards the voice. And as I jumped up, the first thing I remember isn't what I would think I would remember, but I jumped out of the bed, and I looked, and I saw my feet. They were flat on the ground, just like everyone else's, which sounds normal, but not for me. I had foot drops so badly I couldn't even wear slippers on my feet. They were so curled. So when I jumped up to have feet flat, I was amazed and stood staring at my feet. And when I did that, I jumped like this, and then I saw my hands. And they were open, and they never opened. And so now they were open, and I stood staring at them, and then it dawned on me I could see me. That's what I would have thought I would have noticed mm. first was my vision, but I didn't. It I was noticed back. You could see. It was back. I was perfectly fine. And I stood staring again for a little while, just feeling what it felt like to look at and see me. And then I turned, and that's when we were like women. We all started jumping up and down, screaming and thanking the Lord. I remember I didn't understand anything except where once I was real sick, I was well again. And it has to be God. That's all I knew. Yeah. Anyways, again, very impressive healing with uh, Barbara Snyder there. Um, so many things that were going on with her. And so here is a news clip, uh, paper clipping of Barbara's recovery, um, as well as a medical report signed by her doctor, Dr. Harold Adolph, uh, 82881, uh, about what happened. And so, um, yeah, I, I would say out of all of these, I find this one to be the most impressive. Um, but to kind of recap here, um, and then we're going to talk about some objections. So don't go anywhere um, because we're going to talk about skeptical objections. And if you have questions in the chat, um, super chats would definitely be preferred, of course. Um, I'll be able to see those a whole lot easier. Uh, but also, uh, you know, if you can't do that for whatever reason, uh, type in question so that I can search for you easily. Otherwise, just comments just get buried. And so I won't be able to see it. So uh, either of those will work if you do have questions. So these miracles meet the criteria that we talked about. Okay, they're medically documented um, for all of them. They were progressively getting worse. Uh, they were organic. They were not just, um, you know, again, psychosomatic. Uh, these were instantaneous healings that were complete and spontaneous and permanent. Okay, and so out of all of these that we looked at, uh, these are ones that I picked that are very, very strong. Now, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are many more, and I'll, at the end of the video, uh, talk to you about resources that you can get in your hands to see more of these cases. And so, um, again, why do we bring up modern miracles? Well, if miracles occur in the modern world, this informs our background knowledge. There is no compelling reason to a priori reject the Gospels as partially true when we reporting mundane events, if skeptics will even give you that. A lot of times they're just saying the gospel writers are just making things up for theological purposes. Um, but yet we don't need to think that they're just greatly embellished when it comes to describing miracle claims, okay? 
Uh, contemporary miracles are consistently reported within Christianity and cannot be well explained naturally. Uh, these miracles align with the claims of Christian theology regarding divine intervention. Thus, the occurrence of these miracles provides evidential support for Christianity's truth claims and enhances the credibility of the gospel accounts. Now, let's talk about some objections. And again, if you have some objections, um, maybe you're a skeptic, um, put, put them in the chat. Uh, I, we can discuss them. I'm definitely happy to do that. That's why I'm going live. I want to interact with you guys, right? Uh, improbable things happen. So this is something that you'll hear. Spontaneous remission is when a disease or condition improves or disappears on its own without uh, medical treatment. This phenomenon involves significant improvement without a clear cause or medical reason. Although it's very rare, not well understood by science, spontaneous re remission has been observed in conditions like cancer and autoimmune disorders. Well, how do we respond to the whole objection about spontaneous remission? Um, well, sure that can explain some things. Uh, notice I'm not giving any of those particular cases of like cancer or something like that. Um, I don't think spontaneous remission does a very good job explaining the very many varied instances of the reports that we do have, including the regrowth of intestines. Uh, explain that with your spontaneous remission. <laughs> uh, or healing of a paralyzed stomach. Um, or really any of these cases that I've gone through. Uh, the reason why I pick them is because spontaneous remission doesn't fit the bill, okay? The events that we're discussing are capable of being identified by some other fact that they happened. So this is an, an additional argument here. It's not just that they happened. Uh, they have an independent specialness to them, okay? The events occurred in response to prayer or healing of an inward voice telling them to act. And so all of these particular miracles and healings um, involved prayer, some sort of act of faith, healing uh, hearing uh, the Holy Spirit or some kind of inward voice talk to them. And so J.P. Moreland likes to use this illustration. Um, it's a rare event for, say, you know, I don't know, a 40-year-old woman to get into her car and the car to just kind of stop working and she just runs off the road and dies, okay? That's a rare event. And But if it happened, we wouldn't say like that there was any sort of agency necessarily involved other than maybe her own or something again like i said that went bad with the car which is not agency at all obviously but if let's just say we have in our background knowledge the fact that we find out that her husband was cheating on her and maybe he was uh, dating his his secretary or his boss and he took out a big insurance policy uh on his wife uh just a few months ago and he bought two tickets to uh, go to Jamaica. Well, okay, suddenly that looks like design. That looks like foul play, right? And so now we could invoke some kind of agency. And so I don't think the improbable things happen objection works very well. And saying things like, and, and this is something that you do here, well, maybe it's just a scientific anomaly. And we don't understand you know, why right now with our limited knowledge, but someday future scientists will understand this and they'll know and it will fit you know within my view of atheism or my view of naturalism well this is just circular reasoning this is completely begging the question i mean come on you're just assuming that future scientists will come along be able to explain these anomalies and it's going to fit within your worldview uh, i'm sorry that particular dog just won't hunt Moreover, the advancement of our medical knowledge has made events such as complete healing from gastroparesis or intestinal regrowth more challenging to explain through natural causes rather than simpler. And so the more our scientific knowledge grows, the more we understand that these things are improbable. As science is progressing, the more we know that these are even more rare and, and even more impossible. All right. So Another objection, miracle and prayer studies should be repeatable and under controlled and replicable conditions rather than being based on case studies. So somebody's inevitably going to probably bring up uh, the STEP uh, project, which was something that was funded by the uh, Christian run organization, the Templeton Foundation. It was a 10 year, $2.4 million study uh, on the therapeutic effects of intercessory prayer uh, by Harvard Medical School investigated uh, they, they investigated prayer's impact on uh, over 1,800 cardiac bypass patients across six hospitals. 
Patients were divided into three groups. One received intercessory prayer, another didn't. Both unaware of the prayer status and a third group was informed that they should be prayed for. Complications um, from surgeries were monitored, monitored. The study found no differences in complications between those prayed for and those not. And those aware of the prayer actually um, experienced more issues. This comprehensive study underscores the lack of evidence for the miraculous effects when applying scientifics beyond anecdotes. And so the skeptic is gonna complain, look, prayer studies have shown this stuff there's nothing to it. All you got is anecdotes. And when we actually do some sort of scientific study on this stuff, you know, it, it, it doesn't work. There's, there's no results. Um, so we don't want to hear it with your case studies. Well, this whole controlled conditions objection, I think is misguided. If God exists, uh, he would be personal and he would make decisions like a person rather than behaving like a law of nature. God would freely choose when to perform miracles based on his own knowledge and human reactions and what is going to ultimately be benefit everybody. Uh, we as human beings can't really hope to predict God's actions uh, and man's response. We're, we're not omniscient. And so I just, again, I don't think this works. God is not trying to behave like a natural law, okay? He's not a science experiment. Um, if miracles were repeatedly observable under controlled conditions, I think skeptics would be very tempted to see them as natural laws uh, akin to the observer effect in quantum mechanics. Such predictability would establish a scientific law without requiring a divine element. And so it just kind of undo, undoes the whole reason for, for God to do these things. Uh, thus, case studies outshine constant repeatability as they account for the unpredictability of miracles and offer better evidence for the free agent's role. Now, there's other things that I could say about this particular objection, like well, what was the faith involved in the patients who were being prayed for? What was the faith of the prayers? Uh, what is the spiritual, spiritual condition of both parties that are involved? And does the Bible even really prescribe like just, you know, anonymous prayer for anonymous subjects uh, under some sort of lab-like conditions? You know, there's just all kinds of problems with that particular objection. Okay, we got a couple more. Um, been going for about 53 minutes. Thank you guys again so much for hanging with me. I really appreciate it. Uh, if you like this video, um, please leave uh, a like, you know, do all the YouTube -y things. If you find this helpful, share it and all of that good stuff. Uh, continue to, again, if you have questions, ask me in the chat. Just again, type in question then your question, or again, if you can do a super chat, I would greatly appreciate it. And those are really easy for me to see. Otherwise, I have to do control find and search for them. So uh, objection, people lie. Okay. Um, this is a pretty desperate maneuver, uh, I think. Um, so I'll just read this. It's extremely unlikely that the experiencers misunderstood their experience or suffered from mental illness. The absence of significant mental illness is supported by available biographical information that we have in all of these cases. Um, and obviously in these cases, we can't just chalk this all up to mental illness. Common explanations like false memories and confabulations don't apply considering the individual's mental health. When excluding these explanations, the remaining option for a committed phys uh, metaphysical naturalist is the, to accuse the, uh, the subjects of deception. So in short, what I'm trying to say is if you're going to say, well, this can't be true, this this all has to be lying because it doesn't fit within my worldview, again, that really reeks of desperation. Uh, the notion that all those that were involved with the individual miraculous reports, doctors, witnesses, friends, family members, are part of an elaborate hoax, strains credibility, and is extremely ad hoc. Moreover, it is unjust, uncharitable, and violates the golden rule to accuse somebody of deception, especially in matters of great importance, without sufficient evidence of them actually deceiving. The mere claim of a, oop, I got a typo there, of, of a miracle, <laughs> of a miracle is not by itself adequate evidence for deception. Upon becoming aware of relevant information about miracles, persisting as a settled naturalist is either immoral or irrational. This is actually not me necessarily talking um, um, paraphrasing this from a philosopher uh, by the name of Travis Dumsday, who actually has a really interesting video on uh, Jordan Hampton's channel, The Analytic Christian. Again, Travis Dumsday, it's on uh, evidentially compelling religious experiences. Go check that out. But basically what Dumsday argues is, is be I'm becoming acquainted with the relevant facts, like some of these case studies. If you're going to be a settled naturalist and you say that they're lying, you're immoral. So that's one horn of the dilemma. The other part of the dilemma is if you're going to say, I'm aware of these case studies, they define all medical odds, 
And I understand that they were done in the context of prayer and people hearing what they claim to be was a voice, but I'm going to remain a settled naturalist anyway. Well, that's irrational. So at a minimum, at a minimum, you ought to at least become an unsettled naturalist. You ought to be willing to reconsider your view of the world. You ought to be more open to a theistic view of the world, which can accommodate the facts. And particularly, I think the Christian theistic view outshines them all um, for other reasons besides just these cases, but also for the, the, the reasons that we can argue for historically uh, with uh, the reliability of the gospels, the resurrection of Jesus, um, the, the trilemma argument, you know, Jesus' own self-claims, was he a liar, was he a lunatic, was he a lord, are these all just legends? Uh, we can talk about arguments from fulfilled prophecy and all of those things. And in the future, maybe I'll do lives like this one, if you guys like these kind of videos, uh, where we just do kind of a long form, go through those arguments and the objections for those as well. So um, finally, and I think this is probably the most common objection that I hear, and that miracles make God unjust. And so the claim that God has worked a miracle implies that God has singled out certain persons for some benefit, which many others do not receive implies that God is unfair. There may be two cases which are similar in all the ways that seem relevant, yet in one case there will be a recovery which some deem as a miracle, and in another case there is no recovery. This is me quoting a philosopher, uh, James Keller, uh, in a paper in Faith and Philosophy called The Moral Argument Against Miracles. So basically, you know, we could have all the relevant details. This, you know, one person could be in Barbara Comiskey Snyder's case and Barbara is healed and then someone in the same case dies. How, how could that even be just, right? How is that fair? Uh, is God just picking and choosing? This, this, this doesn't seem right. Uh, here's another philosopher. This is Christine Overall uh, in her paper, Miracles, Evidence, Evil, and God, a 20-year debate uh, in philosophical or Canadian philosophical review. Uh, she says, as those who would define the, those who would defend, excuse me, the argument from evil point out, there's a huge amount of evil in the world, uh, psychological and physical suffering, malnutrition, starvation, pandemics, cruelty, torture, poverty, racism, racism, lynching, sexism, child abuse, assault, war, sudden deaths from natural disasters. The list is appalling. Uh, instead of using miracles to feed a small number or transform water into wine or to convert a few people, God could very well be performing miracles that have a much larger effect, especially on the lives of millions of children who are suffering, uh, is particularly incomprehensible to anyone with a sense of justice. The question why a good God would be concerned with details like needing wine at a wedding, referring to, of course, uh, John chapter 2, and yet apparently not be concerned with huge tragedies like the Holocaust, of six million Jews. And so why is God healing Bruce Van Natta or Chris Gunderson or Barbara Snyder? Um, and yet there's the Holocaust, there's uh, kids being tortured and, and human trafficked and all kinds of things like that. Those are some of the comments that I even saw uh, with the Bruce Van Natta video. And so what, what's up with that? How, well, how do we answer that particular objection? Well, first of all, I think we could say that if God performs any miracles, <laughs> the obvious thing to say is that there is less pain and suffering in the world, not more. Uh, there's also a wide range of philosophical and biblical answers said in the response to the problem of pain and suffering and the problem of unanswered prayer. We don't have to get into all of those, but I'll talk about a couple. Uh, atheism provides considerably fewer resources to explain where God seems to perform miraculous healing. The instances in which God seems to heal somebody in response to prayer offer more compelling evidence for Christian theism than the counterexamples provide for their disconfirmation. So in other words, as my friend Jonathan McClatchy likes to say, there's an epistemic asymmetry, um, or to just kind of put it in, in simple speech, atheists have a lot harder time, in my opinion, explaining away the evidence that I'm talking about than a Christian. They actually have resources to explain why God allows evil and suffering in the world, okay? I, that I think are, are more compelling, or at least take some of the, the sting out of the particular objection, where I don't think the atheists have the same resources when they say, okay, well, statistical anomaly, uh, spontaneous remission uh, is obviously a hoax. People were lying. You know, again, those are pretty desperate ad hoc moves um, to, to make. Uh, also, experiencing miracles doesn't necessarily make one's life more comfortable. Just look at the Apostle Paul. I mean, 
he said in second Corinthians 12, 12, that he performed the signs of an apostle. He himself, uh, experienced the risen Jesus uh, on an encounter on the Damascus road. Um, his eyes fell blind. Uh, Ananias prayed for him. His eyes were opened. Uh, he cast out demons. He healed the sick. He did all kinds of things uh, reportedly. Uh, and even in his letters, he talks about it if you aren't buying what is written in the book of Acts. And yet he was persecuted from town to town. He was stoned and left for dead. He was beaten many times. And he took his licking and he just kept on ticking. And so miracles do not necessarily guarantee that you're going to experience a better life. Okay. Um, finally, and this comes again from Caleb Jackson. I'm going to give him uh, credit and then uh, I'm going to give him credit one time. And then after that, I'm stealing it. It's just my, my response, but no, I'm, I'm just joking around. Uh, if God were always to instantly answer our prayers, the moment we ask, regardless of our spiritual condition, or circumstances, we would lose many of the benefits that come with soul building, faith, hope, patience, humility, empathy, courage. On the other hand, if God never answered our prayers in any kind of extraordinary way in anybody's life at all, it would harm our relationship with him and make us less dependent on him if he was a deistic kind of God, right? We wouldn't have any past experience to reflect upon and see any noticeable goodness. We're actually in a situation where we appear to have the best of both worlds. God allows sufficient suffering for character development while also extending help through his mercy as we learn to cooperate better with him. And so when you are in particular trials, tests, tribulations, and different things like that, you do have an opportunity to grow in faith, hope, patience, like I said, humility, empathy for others, um, courage, different things like that. And so I, I don't think God is just going to shake out any a miracle every time somebody's like, oh, no, help. You know, like, uh, that's just not the way that this works. So uh, finally, it, it wouldn't be for our benefit is what I'm trying to say. Uh, finally, the Christian God himself, and this is one of the things that I think just causes Christianity, at least from an existential standpoint, to stand head and shoulders above any other theistic religion, is that the Christian God himself entered into our suffering. I mean, he sweat great drops of blood in the garden, right? He was betrayed by one of his closest associates. He was abandoned by all of his friends. He was denied by his closest follower. He endured the scourging at the pillar. He, with, you know, all the, the, the cat and nine tails and the, the, the teeth and nails or whatever was in that whip, um, it, it was, he had a crown of thorns that he had to wear. He endured, uh, he was hit on the head with, with reeds and mocked and spit upon. Uh, of course, we know that he was crucified. Nails went through his hands and his feet. He was basically suffocated to death in excruciating pain while he hung upon the cross. He entered into our sufferings. And so I've had a mother die of a heart attack. I've had aunts die of cancer. Uh, I myself have experienced uh, high levels of anxiety where I couldn't sleep literally for several weeks. Okay. And so looking to the cross, looking to the God who has entered into our suffering and has become one of us, and he's not just standing far, far aloof, at least offers some resources, some spiritual, existential help, emotional help to know that he is a God who can sympathize. He is not a high priest who is not touched with the feelings of our infirmities so that we can boldly come to the throne of grace and ask for mercy and grace to help in a time of need. This is something that Christianity offers that other religions don't. So there is my uh, my preach there. So this is just the tip of the iceberg that we touched on here. So if you want more of this, and we'll get to your questions in just a second here, if there are any. Um, Case for Miracles by Lee Strobel is a good starting point. Uh, again, if you know Lee Strobel's books, it's it's meant for just total beginner level. Um, and so, but he does have some interesting case studies, including the one of Barbara Snyder. Uh, so get a copy of that, check that out. Uh, there's also a simple guide to experience miracles by JP Moreland. I did an interview with JP about this particular book several years back that you're welcome to also watch. Uh, he talks about some of the different cases there, uh, but he does talk about some different healing cases, even some that he per personally um, was able to witness and experienced himself. Uh, there's also dialogues on miracle, uh, which is really a philosophical treatment on the whole argument against miracles. There's a lot about Hume there. It it's a dialogue, it's like students, kind of 
arguing with each other with their philosophy professor. It's a pretty interesting, good book. But at the end of the book, there is an appendix where Larmer documents, I believe, six different case studies, uh, one which he um, was able to interview himself, if I remember correctly. And I also did an interview uh, with Dr. Larmer that you can go back and watch. Uh, he talks about um, a person that he was able to interview who was also healed from multiple sclerosis. Um, Miracles Today by Craig Keener. Really good book. Um, there's also, of course, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of his two volume set, um, Miracles, the Credibility of the New Testament Accounts. But if you want basically the easy to read, more popularized version with, I would say, probably the stronger case studies, Miracles Today is what you're going to want to grab. Uh, it's, it's cheaper, it's lighter, it's less shelf on, it's less space on your bookshelf. Uh, and it's got the best studies, so definitely avail yourself to that. And then uh, I want to plug Caleb Jackson's uh, forthcoming book, Proving Prayer. Uh, at least that's, I believe, the tentative name of the title, An Argument from Christian Miracles. Caleb is basically kind of, what he's doing different from Keener is he's using the criteria to judge, and he's presenting the very best cases. And he has found a lot of cases that you're probably not going to find in Keener's books. Uh, Caleb is just a miracle detective. And uh, definitely check out, again, his stream uh, that he did with Cameron Bertuzzi on Capturing Christianity, uh, or the one that he did with Braxton Hunter on Trinity Radio. Uh, very much worth uh, looking at. And so uh, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate you guys hanging with me again. Sorry for some of the, the audio hook, hook, uh, hiccups. See, I'm uh, hiccuping the hiccup there. So let's get to your questions. Again, I appreciate you guys kind of bearing with me. Let's see. Of course, there's somebody named Question Everything in the chat. He's just throwing everything off. And so uh, let's uh, let's try something here. Dark Wolf. Here we go. We got one question. There's somebody at least who's following the rules. Dark Wolf, uh, appreciate all the comments, brother, and uh, just being a part of the community. Um, I see you around a lot. Uh, I feel like you always have something good to add to the discussion. If someone dislikes the video, are they still morally <laughs> obligated? to click the like button this stream is objectively good no okay well hey thanks i appreciate the compliment uh that uh is encouraging to me um yes uh if you dislike the video are you still morally obligated to click the like button um yeah man i don't know just any any engagement is good engagement um it does help the algorithm at least so i'm told um so uh, I wish I had a witty and quick comeback for that, my man Wolf, but I don't. Um, he says the answer is yes. Okay, thank you. That, that was the, the, the quick answer there. So uh, I'll give you guys a look one more time, see if there's anything else. Um, nope, that is it. You guys have no questions. Okay, well, I appreciate you guys watching this first stream. Please let me know did, if you guys like this video. Um, maybe throw it in the stream right now. Uh, do you want to see more videos like this, the, the kind of longer form lives uh, where I can answer your questions? I know that this was kind of impromptu. I only gave you guys about an hour warning. Ah, here we go. We've got a question coming in from Lego David. Have you experienced or heard anything regarding miraculous healings yourself? Yes. Um, actually, I have witnessed one. I would like to confirm it with a doctor. I'm going to leave the person anonymous because I haven't asked their permission. Um, but I was at my church, it was two years ago, and we had a guest minister speaking at our church. And um, they, uh, I don't know what, what exactly, I don't remember all of the specific details. Uh, I'm a little foggy on it. Um, but basically, they started um, calling out healings by, uh, I'm a Pentecostal, so what we would call by the word of knowledge where basically they were calling out particular conditions. And uh, I know a lady who her, had a foot in a boot. Um, she was wearing crushes, crutches. She needed double knee replacement. Um, she was in, in bad, bad shape, uh, lots of pain, um, was missing a lot of church services. And when she did show up, you just looked at the look on her face and she just looked like she was just suffering and you just felt bad for her. She had a, um, to, uh, surgery scheduled um, for knee replacement, but it was a little while out and she was really suffering. Um, and then the minister asked if anybody had any testimonies of anything that God had done. And she got up on stage, climbed the steps, no crutches, uh, did multiple squats, um, ran around the front. And she has not, 
She's part of our praise and worship team. She has not come back to church with any of the crutches. Uh, she doesn't show any signs of like serious pain or anything else like that. I don't know what her doctor has said. She didn't get the double knee replacement. Um, and so I would like to like kind of confirm with her doctor. I would even wouldn't mind even talking to her, having her on. But that was one that I witnessed personally uh, that I saw and was there for. Uh, another one, I wouldn't necessarily call this like miraculous myself. It was kind of more of like a rescue. And some of you have heard me that heard me tell this story. Uh, but about 20 years ago, I was driving uh, down a highway in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was going to visit my wife who worked at a uh, hotel and the visibility was really bad. The sun, sun was coming this way. I was kind of going up a hill. What I didn't realize, and this was a highway that you could go 70 miles an hour on. There was a car completely stalled out in the middle of the freeway, which is crazy. And there were people like frantically running around trying to fix the car, get the car on the side of the road, something. As I was driving, I couldn't see anything, but I was kind of like praying while I was driving to see my fiance, then wife. And I heard a voice, it's just like an inward voice, but it was very, very authoritative. And it said, get in the other lane. So without even thinking about it, I switched lanes. And I narrowly, I saw those the guys frantically running around on the highway. Uh, I narrowly missed them. And so I was like, whoa. Sadly, there was another car behind me that didn't switch lanes and they hit full on collision at full speed, that car. I could hear the glass shatter and I saw, I literally saw pieces because it, it pushed that car. I literally saw pieces of like glass or debris um, and I kind of freaked out a little bit. Uh, I pulled off on the shoulder. I called 911 and um, yeah. And so Obviously, I feel bad for all the people that were involved. I don't think that I'm special. Again, I'm sure somebody will bring up the problem of evil. And what do you think you're God's pet? No, I was just praying in, in a situation where I was in conversation with God. So maybe it was easier for him to talk to me. I don't know. I don't have a fully adequate explanation for it. I'm just thankful that it happened. Uh, I feel bad for the people that were involved. But that's as close as a, a miracle that I would ascribe. Uh in my own situation. And it's not really a miracle. It's just, I heard a voice and just saw something, was aware of something that, you know, a terrible accident that I was able to avoid. And so uh, hopefully that answers your question. Really good one, Lego David. I really appreciate the question. Uh, let's see if there's any else. Um, no, I don't think so. I'll just check one more time. Thanks again, you guys for bearing with me. Ah, Sammy Warner. Um, just missed you there. Thank you, Sam, for the question. It says, is it true that there are other religions other than Christianity that have God incarnating as a man or is Christianity the only one? I mean, there are like other avatars as, as far as I'm aware of and different things like that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's like some sort of a deity, but it, usually these are like polytheistic ones. Uh, I would say that out of all of these particular faiths, Christianity has the one uh, with historical evidence, uh, most people think that Jesus really was a person uh, who existed in time and space. Uh, there's also the fact that we have uh, good evidence to believe that Jesus himself claimed to be divine um, through arguments for the reliability of the Gospels. Uh, even a lot of times skeptics will uh, sometimes grant that like Jesus, he did call himself the son of man. Well, arguably, if you look at Daniel chapter 7, 13 and 14, it talks about that son of man being one who's given rulership over the nations and who is worshiped. I don't particularly argue that way. I just argue for the reliability of the gospels and that we have Jesus's words that go back to what the original eyewitnesses claimed. And John's gospel, he says that I and the father are one. If you see me, you've seen the father. Before Abraham was, I am. Uh, I think Jesus is the one who actually backed it up because there's good evidence that he rose from the dead and that that evidence is early. Uh, that that evidence, again, goes back to eyewitnesses who made that claim in a hostile audience, uh, to a hostile audience. And so I would just say that the evidence for the Christian miracles historically is going to be better for any of these other people who claim to be some sort of divine being. Um, most of them come later, um, are not from eyewitnesses. And again, all of these things have to be argued for, obviously, which is the whole point of my channel. And so if you're interested, just see my playlist on the reliability of the Gospels. 
And again, I would like to maybe do some future streams. We could maybe talk about criteria for judging miracles in the past. We talked about these kind of healings. Um, we could talk about like ancient miracles. How do you judge those? What criteria do you use? I've already done videos on that. Um, if you just look back for, I think it's called like doubts filter. If you search my channel for that, I discuss it, but maybe we'll do a, a stream on that or just watch Tim McGrew's debate with a philosopher by the name of Zachary Moore, where they talk about miracles in other religions and how Christianity's just outshine these other claims head and shoulders above. So uh, definitely check that out. I would say if you wanna see a really one-sided debate, um, that would be it because Tim just kind of mopped the floor up with, with more. He basically answered his objections before he could even give them. It was, it was quite a uh, trouncing, um, wishlist 011. Thank you so much for the question. I really appreciate it. Uh, it says, wouldn't healing miracles that fall between whenever asked and often enough to be recognized or control and clinical studies suit both faith and hope for stronger evidence? That's a good question. Um, I think whenever asked, there's a lot of caveats with whenever asked. I mean, obviously the Bible talks about, um, you know, whatever things you desire, believe that you receive them and you shall have them, right? Uh, it talks about ask, receive, that your joy may be full. But it also talks about, you know, asking amiss. It talks about asking with wavering. Um, there, there's all kinds of different conditions that the Bible itself puts on prayer that one would have to meet. Um, in order to to benefit from it. Um, I, I don't think just if I ask, you know, okay, God, um, take this, uh, I don't know, this goiter, this little growth that I have on <laughs> off me away instantly, like that's going to really build my faith. I think faith is a, a trust and it, it's something that there's a persistence to faith, okay? There's, there's something about faith where, you're willing to persist. You're willing to be patient. You're willing to be steadfast. You're willing to believe in the face of contrary evidence that God seems to like. It says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so, but it, that doesn't mean that he doesn't give any evidence whatsoever for his existence or that he's true or that he's reliable. Um, but there is something where uh, about uh, a tenacity, a patience. And again, it, it when I am going through a particular trial, like in my particular case where I had insomnia for like six weeks in a row, um, and I'm talking about like sleeping an hour a night, I'm not talking about you slept four hours a night and you kind of survived and you were like a, a woman who just gave birth to a child. No, I'm talking about it was bad. Um, that gave me a lot of empathy for people who are going through severe anxiety or different things like that. Uh, that gave me uh, a lot of, of goods in, in terms of patience, in terms of trusting God, in terms of having a deeper relationship with him, in terms of learning what I did to open the door to that particular thinking to begin with. Um, now that, again, that's a, a mental condition rather a physical condition. So that might be kind of getting astray here, but um, I think there's just a lot more goods overall. And then just, you know, wapo, zappo, you know, you put in the dollar and out it comes from the vending machine. I don't think that that is the kind of uh, faith that God is looking for. I don't think that he's looking to be our butler um, and just do, every, you know, our bidding every time we ask and instantly do it. I, I just don't think that that's going to develop a lot of character in us. So hopefully that that helped. I uh, wasn't too long winded there, uh, but I appreciate the question. Uh, let's see if there's any more before we wrap up. I really appreciate it. Um, I think that is it. All right. Well, you guys, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Thank you guys so much for watching. And um, if you like this kind of video and you want to support me, um, I do have a Patreon. It is, is Jesus Alive, um, not testify just because that was the blog that I started off with. And it's kind of hard to go back and change all of those links. And so avail yourself to that. I really appreciate any of your support in any kind of way. And um, thank you guys so much for watching and I hope you have a wonderful day.